Okay. Uh, oh, I'm going to take a picture of you guys as usual. I should do that before I get wired up here. But Seems like not too many people, 2, 4, 6, 18, 12, 14, 16, only 18 out of 31, 20. Uh, let me turn this off. Okay, uh, just a couple of quick examples uh, further about Dyxis. Uh, this is one that a student wrote to me, uh, which is in. May I know if perhaps next Monday, uh, 12.30 p.m., and she was writing to me on Saturday. So for her, next Monday meant the following Monday. Uh, and, but when I clicked you know, on Apple machines, you can just click on a date, and it will set it in your calendar for you automatically. But when I clicked on the date to insert it in the calendar, it, the appointment it made me was for the 7th of October, not the 30th of September. In other words, not two days after this. So Apple's idea of what was next and my idea of the next were again different. Um, and then this is in terms of uh, uh, an aphora, uh, that you can use any word to refer to the same person again or same thing again. So here we have, uh, uh, we need tech optimists to shoot for the moon, literally in Musk's case, you know, the Elon Musk is actually shooting for the moon. Uh, but I sometimes think tech companies also need to give more voice to chief pessimism officers who ask, what if this technology doesn't work? Who might be harmed by this technology? And how can we prevent that? And do we need this at all? Give those IORs or EORs, EORs uh, a corner office, right? So everybody understand what EOR refers to? Again, you don't have deprived childhood, deprived childhood. Uh, you know that Eeyore is this kind of always depressed donkey uh, in the, the poo books, uh, many of the poo books. Uh, and so here they're referring to the same people, the, the pessimism, the chief pessimism officers, in other words, people who are very pessimistic about technology. So talking to them, talking about referring to them as Eeyores. Uh, when saying you should treat them nice, giving them a corner office means treat them nice. Okay, today we're talking about uh, reference, sense and reference. So when we refer to things, you know, it's a little bit like anaphora and dykes, that's why I gave you the same, you know, the, the two handouts together, because they're really kind of related, is how do we refer to things? So these both, both of these lessons are about how do we refer to things? So uh, a lot of times when people refer to something, you know, there's an, there's an established name that we use for it. Sometimes we make up names, sometimes we use, do we have nicknames for things, or within our own family, we may come up with our own names that nobody else knows outside the family. Uh, so there's lots of different things. And then there's this question that we're gonna talk about is this, the idea of, is there any sense to these? And, or is it just reference, or is there both? Uh, so uh, this was something that happened to me in uh, Changi Airport. I was buying, a, a, one of my nephews passed law, the law bar in the Philippines, so I was going back to the Philippines, and so I thought I'd give him a, a bottle of Dalmore 18, uh, actually only 12 year old. Uh, I'm not that rich that I could buy an 18 year old. Um, so I, I, I bought this, and the woman said, I said to the woman, you know, how can I get this to, you know, security? She says, I'll give you a shoe. I was like, what? And so uh, several times I asked her, how am I gonna get this through security? And she says, I'll give you a shoe. And I kept, she kept saying it, and I was like, what, what is a shoe going to do for me, right? And then it turns out this plastic bag is called a shoe. I had no idea about that. You know, like we know the names of things only if we've had experience with them. And so our, our knowledge of the language is all really about our memory of our own experiences. We really, uh, it's not like we all have this 
language in our heads. This is what one of the problems of the early structuralist view is that it's supposedly everybody had the same language system in, in all of their heads. All of the, the community speakers had the same language. But we all have very different experiences with language. And so what we think of as our knowledge of language is going to be very different. So in this case, I had never heard the word shoe used for a plastic bag that gets you through security kind of thing. So, uh, so that was kind of eye-opening. And you know, there are a lot of times you, you have very personal experiences that allow you to learn about how to talk about certain things that you never did before. And also you have the other opposite situation. I had a very, very embarrassing situation once when uh, I was still in the US in the 1980s. Uh, there weren't that many people who spoke with Chinese in those days. And so the, the State Department uh, was bringing the, the former ambassador from China to California to UC Berkeley for a talk. And so they asked me to translate for him. So I said, Shit. I said sure, no problem. Uh, I, I do that kind of thing all the time because you know we, we always have talks by Chinese visiting scholars and stuff that I translate for. They didn't tell me ahead of time it was on nuclear disarmament. It's like. I've never talked to anybody about nuclear disarmament in Chinese. I have no idea how to talk about intercontinental ballistic missiles and all this other stuff. So I kind of made it up uh, as we went along. You know, I still had to do it. They were not happy uh, with some of my things, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, I told them, look, I, I just never talked to anybody about this. So of course, my experience doesn't include uh, talking about missile types and uh, strategies for you know dealing with this. Okay, so now we're talking about the use of words and stuff. And of course, how we refer to things can change all the time. And this is why you know language is not a fixed system. So like one of the recent words that come into common usage is the use of unicorn. When I first saw this headline, China is the home of six of the 10 largest unicorns in the world. You know, if 20 years ago, if you said this, people would think, yeah, you're just, you know, making it up because unicorns were only something that existed in uh, stories, uh, fantasies, but now unicorn, and they are using the word unicorn here as if everybody knows that unicorn refers to a certain kind of startup that's very successful very quickly. Um, and this one, um, this guy is talking about um, kind of uh, how changes have been happening. And he says, uh, honestly, I've made peace with the fact that I cannot resist the appeal of uh, these changes. Um, yes, it's rude and disrespectful to crash the show, but chaos is the spice of life. It's easy to look at each other each day as a problem to solve. All of us are rats amazing to work on the commuter train off to find that cheddar. Right? So here is, he's using a metaphor of us rats on a treadmill or on a, you know, those wheels that rats run on. Uh, or running through a maze. Actually, he's confined, you know, he's, this idea that you can run through a maze, uh, they, you know, they often do this as a, a, a test in uh, labs. They run rats through the maze and they put a piece of cheese supposedly at the end of the maze for the rat to get to. But you can use, like, the, what, the reason why I, I highlighted this is the, the word mazing, right? I'd never heard the word mazing before. But it's not a problem for me to try to understand what he means by that, because the the entire uh, thing about you know evoking the metaphor, and I, I know about this thing that happens in labs about wraps in mazes and things like that. So then I can uh, realize that he's using the what to me was always used referentially to mean a maze. He's using it as a verb meaning to work move like we're running through a maze kind of thing, I guess, is what his, his uh, point is. And there's also often controversies about how we refer to things. Um, so there is a new thing now uh, with all of this, uh, you know, since uh, George Floyd's death, there's been a whole rethink of language and, and whatnot, how we talk about things. And in real estate now in the US, um, they're trying to remove any kind of racist or sexist overtones. And so now what we've traditionally called the master bedroom is not going to be called the master bedroom anymore because master assumes, you know, one person is above the other. Um, actually, it, historically, it just meant the owner of the house. But, uh, but they 
want to remove any kind of possible uh, sexist overtones. So now they're not calling it the uh, the master bedroom. They're just calling it the main bedroom or something like that. Okay. Uh, so we can also use words in many different ways, either in a kind of more general way or in a more specific way to refer to something. So here is a play on words where they're doing both at the same time. So if you read this, uh, once, a time, uh, once upon a time there were four people, so now we think we're going to do referential. So their names are everybody, somebody, nobody, and anybody. So these are now referring to four different people. Uh, but as you read this, they're talking about the four people, but because we have experience of these four words used in a more general sense, uh, non-specifically referential to individual people, you get kind of a double meaning at the same time. So uh, there was an important job to be done and everybody was asked to do it. Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. When nobody did it, somebody got mad because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody could, wouldn't do it. Ended up, everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have in the first place. The moral of this story is that when you find yourself saying somebody should pick up the trash or make a sign or outreach or educate or organize donations or occupy, remember you are somebody. So we've got kind of three meanings of this somebody here uh, going on, right? So um, and isn't that what you always want it to be? So in this case, the idea is that they're, they're playing on, on the, the common situation that when you say somebody should pick up the trash, you're identifying a problem, but you're kind of pushing off the responsibility onto somebody else, right? So this whole thing is about you taking responsibility yourself for making the world better. Um, and but it, the, it's really interesting the way they do this, that the using these in a referential sense, so these are supposed to be four different people, but when you read it in the non-referential sense, you get a more cohesive kind of uh, story of uh, these, what we call indefinite pronouns, where you know everybody, somebody, nobody, anybody, these are what we call indefinite pronouns. They don't refer to any specific person. Uh, and so this is, uh, I think, a really clever way of playing with that. Now, what do you call this? This is a picture of me, by the way, yes, in my dreams. Uh, what do you call this? What, what, what would you refer to that? If you said, oh, this guy's got a good, what do you call it, huh? Abdomen. Yeah, of course it's his abdomen, but what's, what's the kind of more slang name for it? Uh, like nice muscle structure like that? Six pack, right? Actually, if you search, when I, when I first want to talk about this, I searched for six pack, images of six pack online. 99% were this. Only one picture was actual beer six pack, right? But that, it actually derives from a metaphor of a six pack of beer. And people know that, and, and so they can even play with that. Uh, this is what this is the one picture I got of a six pack of beer, uh, and it's probably not even the right angle to give you the uh, the image of the of the metaphor that we use to refer to that. Uh, and people make fun of it, so they'll play. He's like a six pack belly, you know. Uh, so he's uh, making making a joke out of our metaphorical reference to having good uh, good muscles in your stomach. So. This is one of my points here is that once you have a way of talking about something, it gives you a way to make jokes. I make, you will make extensions, you will make uh, jokes, you will do other things with it once you have that particular way of referring to something. So we'll come back to this in a second. So this is one where he's using you know, a six pack belly here uh, to make a joke. And another way, is you look at this when Kate Beckinsale shows off her washboard stomach as she covers the woman's health. So this is being referred to as a washboard stomach. So this is another metaphor that we often use, or at least in the past. I don't know about your generation, but in, in my generation, we still had this metaphor of a washboard stomach. Now washboard, this is also, this picture came out when I searched for washboard. Um, this is a washboard. Does that look like a washboard? Does that look like a washboard? This is what a washboard is. This is a board for washing clothes, right? Uh, and it, but it has ripples in it. 
So that's why I guess they use that as a metaphor for a rippled stomach. Uh, and again, once you have that metaphor, you can play with it. So you get the same kind of joke, a washboard stomach, exactly the same type of joke. Uh, and you can get other things playing on it. Like uh, he says, everybody has a washboard stomach. Mine just happens to have a load of laundry on top. Right. So here he's taking, again, a different kind of joke, but playing on the, the metaphor of the, the stomach as a, as a washboard. But just like you, if you had the washboard in a tub of, of water, you would have a load of laundry on top of it. And that's his belly. Um, and it's also a musical instrument. Uh, you can play it as a musical instrument. That's actually how my generation actually knows about it more than as a washing thing, because we didn't really wash clothes that way, but we used to use it as a musical instrument. Now, so that's two different metaphors for it. Now, does this look anything like the abdomen with good muscle tone? This is what in the Philippines they call it. In the Philippines, this is this is a kind of bread that they eat in the Philippines called pandasal. Uh, which is actually very salt. Pandasal means salty bread, but it's actually very sweet bread. And they eat this uh, for breakfast and merienda. And so this to them is what the image that they think of uh, when they think, when they see somebody with good. So when you go to a beauty pageant, I've actually been to beauty pageants with men and women both uh, in, in the Philippines. And they'll talk about, wow, that guy's got really nice pandasal, you know. Um, and so having that, uh, you know, is you, you make sense of things and you give names to things based on your own experiences, based on your own culture. So in America, we have six packs of beer. So we can have that metaphor. In the Philippines, even though they drink a tremendous amount of beer, they don't sell six packs. So that's not available to them, right? Even though they know a lot about American culture, Within their own culture, they do not sell six packs. You either buy individual bottles or you buy cases. There's no six packs for sale anywhere. And so that, that, that metaphor is not available to them. The washboard metaphor might be available to them, but um, somehow they don't use that one. But they use this. This is a very available metaphor. So they use this one in referring to, to the stomach. So, so that's my point here is that, you know, each society uh, makes or, or takes things from its own culture to to uh, kind of relate to when it's naming something or giving a new nickname to something that already has a name or a more formal name. And then at the same time, they also, once they have that way of talking about it, they can build on it with either jokes or extensions and other things. So that's one of the ways that language is different. Okay, now there's also differences between uh, even then within the same language, people will use words differently. Uh, so like this one was from uh, The Economist. This is a British publication. So they were talking about, uh, for example, uh, this PwC and accountancy firm will this year hire about 160 school leavers. Those who complete, who complete the dedicated programs can join the same graduate scheme as university leavers with less debt. So they're contrasting school leavers and university leavers, which makes sense in British English, but makes no sense in American English, because in American English, this university is also a school. But in British English, university is not a school. So if you say, you know, I remember when I worked in Australia, Australians also do the same thing. So when we, when we would like um, interview a, uh, a, a potential postdoc or a student, uh, uh, from the US, you know, I remember my colleague would say something like, uh, what have you done since you left school? And the, the student, it was a grad student or something, he would say, well, I'm still in school. And they say, no, 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 what have you, what have you done since you left public school? Uh, so, uh, you know, we can, they make certain distinctions. When I first went to Australia, I lived in Australia for seven years, and when I first went there, I was totally freaked out by how different their English was, and I was so, um, like feeling I was walking on quicksand or something because I had no idea what was going on around me and uh, very insecure. Uh, it took me quite a while to, to really get used, not just the pronunciation, but the grammar is different, the, the lexical items, the use of, even when you have the same word, the use is different. So, uh, and 
like here, there's sometimes it's it's just an individual thing. It's it's not necessarily something that uh, is within the whole language, but in a particular context, you may contrast things. So sometimes you have contrast between words, uh, and those contrasts can be important in terms of how you understand the use of the words. So it's not really in the words. It's you can see how contextual this is when it's when it's particular contrast. So in this one. I intended when I when I wrote this message, I wrote a message about um, the schedule indicates that week 13 is allocated for the final exam, while the last official lecture is in week 12, and the instructions mention that the assignment is in the last day of lecture. So the what the student was asking, may I ask if the submission deadline is in week 12 or week 13? And the confusion was because for her, she was assuming that if I'm giving exam that week, that's that week is not called lecture. So she was contrasting lecture and exam, whereas when I was talking about the last day of lecture, I was contrasting lecture with tutorial. So for me, the exam was given in the last day of the lecture, uh, which is not during the tutorial period, but during the lecture period, whereas for her, it, 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 it was confusing. So she was contrasting lecture and exam. Uh, and so these can, things can be very um, contextual and you know, not necessarily general to the language at all. And then there are, of course, conceptions of how we do things. So like we, we speak English here, but again, there are differences. So like here it says no plastic cans, spray cans, or paint cans. Now in American English, there's no such thing as a plastic can. If it's a can, it's metal. So you recycle cans, you know, and that means metal. Uh, you don't, if it's a, if it's, no matter what shape it is, if it's a plastic and it has a top and everything, then it's a bottle. So it's always going to be a bottle. Uh, it, it can't have a plastic can. But that here you can. So it's just people use, even when they use the same words, they can use them in different ways. And it just depends on what their intention is. Uh, I don't know what a plastic can would look like, but uh, unless these, are these meant to be plastic cans? I guess, yeah. Yeah, plastic cans, spray cans, and paint cans. Yeah, so this must be a plastic can. I don't know what that is, but uh, but it, it, it's just, you know, we all use words differently. And, uh, it's all just a matter of convention and habit. Um, sometimes when you also, when you hear an expression that uh, the a lot of linguists, they will talk about the structure being in the words themselves when you have an, an expression like this that refers to something. Uh, the, the structure, though, is not in the words itself. This is just three words, crazy, rich, and Asians. Now, I, when I read this, the first time I saw this title, I read it as crazy, rich Asians, which I'm quite familiar with people like that. So it made a lot of sense to me. But I was talking to Ivan, who is of a slightly younger generation than me, and he said, no, uh, in our generation, he said, uh, crazy rich is, is a fixed term, and it means like very rich. And I said, well, in my generation, uh, crazy can be used that way, but it has a certain particular connotation of uh, like negative, like crazy drunk. It means he's so drunk, he's crazy. He's very drunk, but it's so drunk he's crazy. It's that kind of sense, not not just very. So anyway, um, the, uh, the the point here is that you can. There is a lot of subjectivity in when you hear something. You are the one who makes the analysis. It's not in the words, and so based on your own experiences, you're going to analyze it in a particular way and understand it in a particular way. Uh, so like this one. Uh, Chaz, do you know how to get to the food chain? And uh, what do you think the food chain is? And then this is his conception of the food chain where you pull on the chain and all the food comes down. He said the Discovery Channel could have been a little bit more clear. Right? So a lot of times you hear a word and you try to make sense of it. Um, so like food chain, if you don't know the, the, you know the normal scientific concept of food chain, then you might come up with something else, uh, some other kind of way of understanding it. There's a lot of folk etymology, you know, people making sense of words in a, a different way. And sometimes that actually even changes the language. So like 
people are either thinking it should be the way it should be with like the word female right if you look at the the normal historical development of the word it should actually be female but because we had male then people thought it should be female and so they changed it to female uh, and so this kind of thing happens and, and also um, you know reanalysis what we call reanalysis or folk um, uh, folk etymology where you uh, assume it means something else and then you you kind of change the way you pronounce it because of that assumption so here it's like a little kid uh, it's Mary Joseph and uh, it's Joseph Mary and Jesus in an airplane they said yep their flight into Egypt so when they tell the Bible stories, they talk about the flight of them, their, their flight into Egypt. And of course, for a little kid, the only kind of flight he's ever been aware of is an airplane. So it makes perfect sense for him to assume they're on an airplane. Um, to because we make, you know, like when I was a little kid, I was always getting in trouble. And my mother would say to me, oh, this is going to go on your record. And I was, the, at that time, the only thing I knew of records were these things I played music on. Uh, they, you know, they said those days 45 RPM or 33 RPM uh, uh, records. And so I thought, how did they write on those? You know, how did they write on that record? It, it took me several years before I realized she was talking about some other thing, like a dossier that the police were going to have or somebody was going to have. I don't know. Uh, but it, because little kids, of course, don't have a dip, the, the experience of something like a record in the documentation sense. But we had sense in terms of these musical discs that we played. And so that's the way I understood it. Uh, this one, Warren Buffett, when asked about the downgrading of Berkshire Hathaway debt, they said some time ago that if they changed the ratings on governments, they would lower the outlook on certain insurance companies because they own a lot of governments. Uh, so here, unless you really know something about the finance business, you might think they own governments in the normal sense of governments. But what, what is he referring to here? Did I say it here? Uh, you can get it from the lower part, but he's talking about government bonds. But if you're in the finance industry, you don't need to specify bonds. You just say governments. And then, then people know that you're talking about the bonds. Uh, not the government itself, although there are some governments you can buy, I guess. Um, so here it says, Buffett, Buffett reportedly said that Berkshire holds more than 40 billion of its cash in short-term treasuries. Treasuries is another word for bonds. They're treasury bonds. Uh, so you can call them government, you can call them treasuries. Um, and in the same article, they're using several different ways to refer to the same thing, but only people who are kind of in the know who have had experience with these, uh, you know, kind of things in in the finance, you would you could be able to figure this all out. Um, and here's another one of these differences between like British or it's Australian and American uh, thing. That Harper's Weekly, it said the Berkeley City Council decided to table a vote on whether Manning should be called a hero. In Australia. That would mean to put it on the table for everyone to vote on. In America, it means take it off the table so you don't vote on it. Exactly the opposite. But it's the same word. Uh, and it, it, historically, of course, words also do change the opposite. So now we say, oh, that's a moot point, right? M-O-O-T, moot point means it's not an important point. But actually, the original meaning of moot was it was very important. And it just became over time to mean not important. So these kind of things happen all the time. Um, and then here's another weird reference uh, where this is from the New York Times, uh, where he said travel restrictions on the overcrowded Inca Trail, which was threatening to become the Long Island Expressway of central Peru, have led some visitors to seek alternative routes to these ancient ruins. So this one struck me as weird because even though it's New York Times, and people, everyone in New York should know what the Long Island Expressway is and know something about the Long Island Expressway that it's always jammed with cars. We call it the world's largest parking lot because it's never, you know, it's just so so jammed with cars all the time. So 
they're using it in that way to when they say it'll become the Long Island Expressway of Central Proof means it will become very crowded with people. Um, uh, and they're talking about the Inca Trail, which is uh, a trail in, in uh, South America, or is it in Central America? I forget now. Uh, uh, where you go and you can visit the, the ruins of the, old, the ancient Inca um, kingdom. Um, and uh, oh, in Central Peru, South South America. Yeah. Uh, so it's um, uh, so. You know, they're using this expression as if, you know, New York, the New York Times, the point I want to make is the New York Times is actually a global, you know, a global newspaper. Uh, and yet they still can use expressions like this. And it, I don't know what, how other people would understand it, how people who don't live in New York, or even people who live upstate New York that don't have any experience of Long Island Expressway, because Long Island Expressway is on Long Island. And New York State is actually quite, quite large. So they may not have experience with that. Uh, and this is an, an, a similar example of using something. So one time I got an email message from an editor at Oxford University Press. And he said, I decided to retire from the press at the end of March. This will be a wrench. I love the job and it's wonderful to be involved in such a fascinating field. But I'll be 68 the following month and need to leave the stage before falling off it. So this for me is what a wrench is. So how is his decision to be a wrench, right? How is it, uh, this will be a wrench. And it's the first time I've seen that kind of usage. Um, so it's like, does it look like that? Uh, so how do you make sense of it? And you just do the best you can from inference that um, not so much wrench in, in, why is this thing called a wrench? It's not because it's shaped like that, but because you do like this. Right, so the the it's like ringing, ringing, wrench, wrestle, all of these root things. They go back to a kind of twisting motion. So, but in this case, when he says it's a wrench, I think he means he's pulled in two different directions. Uh, so he loves the job; he's pulling one direction, and uh, but he has to get off it. He actually was ill, and he died not too too long after this. Um, but uh, so. So, you know, it, it took me a while to figure out uh, why he would use wrench, but yeah. Could it also be because heart wrenching is a fairly conventionalized phrase? Yeah, and why do we say heart wrenching? It's because you feel like your heart is like, like that. So that's, that's the concept of wrench, really. Uh, so yeah, he might, it might have been using it from that metaphor. It didn't occur to me before, yeah. It might have been basing it on that on a metaphor of heart wrenching. So it was a wrench means a wrench of my heart. Uh, could you say that? Uh, but yeah, it would make sense, I guess. But yeah, I hadn't thought about that metaphor. Yeah, that's good. Um, and then this one, uh, looking for Billy, when I saw this, it's like, uh, I thought maybe a kid was lost, uh, except there was these weird numbers next to it. Does anybody know what this is, looking for Billy? Anybody ever go to Ikea? Ikea is a Billy bookshelf and with the dimensions 40 by 28 by 106. It's a kind of bookshelf. You know, Ikea has these weird names for stuff. The bookshelf model is called Billy for some reason. So yeah, it was confusing to me when I first saw the, the, the title though. I mean, the, uh, yeah, the uh, subject looking for Billy. Uh, or this one, do you do refills? Sure, just take your top off. Uh, I mean your lid. You know, he's going to take his shirt off because that's also a top. So how we understand something in context, um, these are of course just jokes, but how you understand something in context is also, you know, kind of generally based on whatever is most salient in that thing. So if you have the same word can be used for different reference, but it depends on the context as to which one will come to your mind. So it's just like the example of the wrench. So the heart wrenching that didn't come to my mind when I saw it. The thing that came to my mind was the, the like the tool wrench. So it, it all depends on what comes to your mind when you do it. So and sometimes that's based on your conceptions. So one time I was in Taiwan, and uh, at my old workplace in Taiwan at the Academia Sinica, and they said. Uh, I said I had some the dead batteries. I said, "Do you have a place to recycle or you know deal with dead batteries?" 
So they said, yeah, there's a Xiangzi in the in this other room where the photocopies are. There, there, there's a box. But to me, I was understanding Xiangzi as something like a box. In my experience with Xiangzi is always there, like that or something, right? Uh, and then when I went in there, I couldn't find it, and I came back out again, and then they pointed out this thing, uh, which is actually even says right on it, Hui Shou Tong, which Tong is like a tube. And if they had said tube, then I would have understood it more clearly. But but she could refer to this as a box, and so then I couldn't find it. Uh, and so this kind of thing happens a lot as well, that we have different conceptions of how a word might be used. And it's not, there's no right or wrong here. It's just based on our experiences of how words have been used, we will use them in different ways. And sometimes we will extend it in ways that we may never have heard before, or, uh, you know, just being creative. And then sometimes, again, going back to this kind of use of words that is uh, when we're not used to it. So like a bushel is a unit of weight equal to four pecks. What's a peck? A quick smooch. Uh, you know, I don't understand math at all, right? Smooch means kiss, in case you didn't know that one. Uh, so a peck is a measure of grain or something, right? But he doesn't know that because we don't measure grain, you know, normally in the suburbs. He's lived in a suburb somewhere. He's not measuring grain. So, uh, so the only thing they can think of is, you know, a peck on the cheek means a kiss on the cheek. So what's a peck? Oh, it means a kiss, right? A smooch, a quick smooch. Uh, and then there's sometimes changes in the culture. I'm doing, this is too long, like too many examples. It's just as I find examples, I keep throwing them in there. And uh, this is a bit too long, but I think this is the, maybe the last one. Let me say, no, nope, still got more. <laughs> no, nope, still, uh, we are okay, there's, there's a few more. Uh, so here's another one. This is a, 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 what for me when I first started was, I considered an abomination. Uh, because there is something that is traditionally called cafe di macchinato. Cafe di macchinato means you take uh, espresso coffee and you put a drop of milk in it. And macchiato means stain. You just stain the coffee with a little bit of milk. And one time I ordered a macchiato, cafe di macchiato, which we usually just call macchiato, and in a, in a place. And they gave me something that looked more like this. And I said, what then is this? And uh, and she said, this is macchiato. And I said, no, it's not. And I said, <laughs> and I, and I looked up at my phone. I said, this is macchiato. And this is, I found out later that this you can call latte di macchiato, which means a stain on the milk. So it's mostly milk and a little tiny bit of coffee rather than it's coffee with a tiny bit of milk. So it's the opposite concept, but I've never seen that before. It's a new kind of concept, uh, this uh, macchiato, the opposite uh, flip side macchiato. Uh, and this one uh, was about 10 years ago, I wrote a column about how I got ticked off by a hawker for not speaking Mandarin when she realized that I could. So this is one that American English and, and Singapore English are the opposite. So in American English, to be ticked off means you are angry. And in Singapore English, it seems from this and some other examples I have that use this, that it means somebody yells at you, right? To be ticked off by somebody means to be yelled at by that person, right? Yes, no? That's the way she's using it here. But there's another one where I have another example where it's a ticked off by a judge, where the, the judge yelled at the person. No, you don't know that? Okay, so maybe I'm making this up. But... Uh, but this was the thing. So she was a Chinese national and berated me for not using the wonderful language. So this is this is my understanding. So berated me means yelled at me. And so ticked off by a hawker means I was yelled at by this hawker. But maybe it's an older usage. I don't know. But in, in America, to be ticked off means to be angry at somebody. Uh, this one I'll skip. It's too long. Uh, and I'll skip that one. OK. Um, okay, so what we're talking about here is sense and reference, and that was really too long. Uh, referring expressions uh, are things you use to refer to something, and I forgot to turn this one on. Okay, so we're talking about sense and reference. I'll start the recording here. 
Uh, referring expressions are expressions used to refer to something, literally. So the thing we refer to is called a referent. So if I'm talking about this plastic box, uh, then this is the referent that I'm talking about. I say this plastic box. So this is the referent with a T that I'm talking about. I'm referring to it. That's the verb that I'm using to re I'm referring to it. And the phenomenon that we're talking about is called reference. Now, a lot of students get confused between reference, referent, referring, and all these others. But uh, so referent is the thing we refer to. Um, so these are things like proper names, regular uh, common names, definite descriptions, uh, anything to refer to something or person in the real world. So that thing, or it doesn't even have to be real world. It can be in a made up world. It's just when you refer to something, when you talk about something, you are referring to it. And so that's reference. So you can use proper names like Jim or Confucius or Bertel Anderson or Barack Obama, or you can use definite descriptions like the writer of this page, the director of that movie, the book I just read, um, or common nouns like salt, iron, stone, uh, beer, car. Now, these were called names in earlier philosophical literature. Uh, they, uh, they were terms, sometimes they're called terms, sometimes they're called names. It's just words we use to refer to things. Uh, and they can be singular or general. So a singular name denotes some individual like Julia Gillard, the former prime minister of Australia, uh, where the Julia Gillard only denotes and does not, does not have a real meaning to it other than it's the person that's referred to. But in the case of the former Prime Minister of Australia, if you use the, the expression the former Prime Minister of Australia to refer to her, the name also can connote an, uh, an attribute to the thing, uh, denoted. So denotation here is referring to the thing. Connotation is kind of saying something about it. Uh, <clears throat> so the general names like red supposedly connote a particular attribute and denote all the things that have the particular attribute. This is according to John Stuart Mill. Now we're gonna, I'm, what I'm doing in this course basically is describing how other people have talked about these phenomena in pragmatics and then give you my alternative take on it uh, and how the theory that I talked about at the beginning, the first two weeks, actually can explain all of the different phenomena that we're going to be talking about without a lot of the messiness and individuality that of the different methods that have been suggested before. So in a proposition, the meaning uh, derives from the connotation of its subject and predicate. This is according to Mill again, except for proper names. But the truth of the proposition derives from the denotation of the names. So what he means is when you say the Prime Minister of Australia for a time was a red-haired woman, the connotation or the kind of meaning of it is the somebody who was the Prime Minister of Australia was a red-haired woman. And now you don't know whether that's true or false though until you know what the reference were. So the reference, the Prime Minister of Australia, in this case, uh, Julia Gillard, was a red-haired woman. If you know who she is, she actually was a red-haired woman. So then you can say this sentence is true. So this was important to, to him. Um, more significant in this field of sense and reference is Gottlieb Frege uh, in the late 19th century. Um, he said we need to distinguish between the sense or intention or connotation of a referring expression, uh, basically the meaning of expression, and the reference, the thing that we're referring to. Uh, and it's kind of similar to, um, to Mill, but he made a distinction uh, in the second of, of tell you about the distinction that he made uh, that made him famous. The sense of the man in the black hat is the male adult wearing a human wearing a hat that is black. And the reference would be to a particular individual in a particular context. He said even adjectives and verbs can have sense and reference. So the extension of red, in other words, the thing that red can refer to is the class of red objects. And the intention, the meaning of red is the property of being red. Uh, but the thing that Frege argued was that uh, you can say like uh, 
a car is a car, he said that would be non-informative. But A equals B is informative. So if you, even if you're talking about the same reference, if you use two different names for it, then it has meaning. Uh, it's informative. So he said um, the morning star is the evening star. So if you know anything about Hesperus and Phosphorus, there are two stars. One was called the morning star, one was called the evening star. But it turns out when they discovered that it's actually the same body of, you know, heavenly body, and it's Venus, the planet Venus. So the planet Venus actually had all these different names. Um, and so when they discovered that the morning star was the evening star, that was actually a major discovery. And really all they were doing is they were saying that these two names referred to the same reference. So here A equals B was very informative. So, um, uh, so the, the names that they had before, the, star, the morning star was the star that appears in the morning, and the evening star was the star that appears in the evening. Uh, and so they, uh, uh, when they found out that these were uh, the same reference, then that was informative. Actually, though, um, A equals B, although it is informative, A equals A is not non-informative. And we do say these things all the time, like war is war, boys will be boys, things like that. And it is informative because the first A and the second A are not really doing the same thing. Their function in the expression is different. Um, so, you know, like when I say the function is different, so like if you say war is war, the first war is referring to war as an entity. The second war is referring to the characteristics of war. So they're actually different meaning, different usage. Um, it's in Michael Halliday is the only linguist who's actually really gone into depth and in talking about this and where he talks about his token and value. So the token, like war is war. Uh, the first war is the token and the, uh, the second war is the value. And the same with boys will be boys. Uh, so this, this kind of thing can make sense and can be informative. A term can also have sense without reference, like the present king of France, where there is no present king of France, but we can still say the expression, the present king of France. Uh, uh, so here's what I just said, that actually Frege was wrong to say the A equals A is uninformative. And one time, I used to go to the, one of these 10 minute, $10 haircut places, you know, uh, in uh, Durham Point or someplace. And some of the times it actually came out not too bad, you know, for a $10 haircut. But one time I came home and it was really bad. My wife said, what the hell happened to you, you know? And I said, well, sometimes when you get a $10 haircut, you get a $10 haircut. So here again, $10 haircut, the first $10 haircut is the token. The thing that I got was a $10 haircut, but it had the characteristics of a $10 haircut. In other words, a really bad haircut. So this is the same kind of phenomenon. So it's the token and value dis distinction that Halliday talked about. Uh, now, then in 1966, uh, Keith Donnellan came up with this idea of definite descriptions used uh, as either attributively or referentially. So if you say something like, the man drinking champagne is my brother, or the man who can lift his stone is stronger than me, the attributive sense is whoever fits the description of the man drinking champagne or the man who can lift his stone. Um, but uh, uh, so it, it's, in other words, to be the right referent, they have to fit that description. But the, uh, the referential use is pointing out a particular person whether or not the, that description of them is true. So it doesn't have to be. So if, if I point out somebody in a bar and there's a guy there with a champagne glass in his hand and I say, oh, that guy drinking champagne, go, go talk to that guy drinking champagne. Even if he's not really drinking champagne, if you can identify the person, then the reference has been good. Uh, so the, the description could be wrong. Uh, he could be drinking apple juice or something else, but the reference could concede, can succeed anyway if the addressee can identify the particular reference. 
Um, if it was used attributively, it would need to be true for the addressee to make the proper identification. You know, you'd have to see, oh, is that one who is really drinking? Right? And there's a really interesting uh, real example of this. Um, I was involved with a book uh, back in uh, around 2005 or so, um, where I, a guy, we were writing, I don't know if you know, in, in the academia, we sometimes put together Festschrift, which is a kind of tribute volume for some academic, right? So it's, they use the, term, the German term Festschrift. Uh, where you, you're writing in a festive way about somebody. And so it's a common thing when somebody turns 60, 70, or 80, or whatever, and you write, you put together his former students and colleagues will put together a collection of papers in honor of this person. So we, we decided to put together a volume about this guy named Bob Dixon. Oops. This guy named Bob Dixon. And, but then, um, so if it refers, uh, so uh, what happened though is Bob Dixon didn't want the first shift. Uh, he was not happy with our, the idea um, for weird reasons. But anyway, uh, so we we had already put the book together. Uh, but then since he said he didn't want to be a first shift, then we just published it anyway as not a first shift. Uh, it's just a normal collection of papers. Uh, it's called a Catching Language, uh, How to Describe Language. And so then we started to use the expression, the book that isn't a festive for Bob Dixon. So now if you think about the meaning of the expression, the book that isn't a festive for Bob Dixon, there is, there's never been a festive for Bob Dixon. So this description fits every book in the world. But if you, anybody who knows the story of this book, and they hear this, they know exactly which book it refers to. This, the book called Catching Language, which was supposed to be a fest trip, but is not a fest trip. So the book that isn't a fest trip for Bob Dixon makes perfect sense to people who know the story. Um, so in this case, uh, we can we can do the reference. We can get the reference, even though the attribution fits every book in the world. <clears throat> Actually, Bob Dixon heard me use that expression one time, and he was not happy. Uh, he, he, didn't, he wasn't a very cheery guy. Uh, in Smith's Murder is Insane, two interpretations are possible. So uh, if you say something like the Smith's Murder is Insane, it could be the speaker is referring to a particular person he or she has in mind and assumes the is the murderer of Smith. So in other words, has a definite reference in their mind. Or the speaker doesn't have any idea who murdered the Smith, and it's just using it in an attributive sense that whoever killed Smith, right? So now Keith Donnellan was talking about this as if it's a property of the words themselves. But as we can see from this example, it's not really about the, the words themselves. It's about your inference of how the speaker is using it, right? It's what you think is the intention of the speaker. Does the speaker have a particular referent in mind, or does the speaker not have a particular referent in mind? So it's really not a, a characteristic of the expression itself. It's a characteristic of your interpretation of this particular type of structure. So the interpretation, like in one, it depends on the speaker's intention and the addressee's successful location of the intended referent, and not on the correctness of the description. So this type is sometimes called speaker reference or semantic reference or attributive reference. But as the definite referring expressions can be used with either speaker reference or semantic reference, it's only by inferring the intention of the speaker in using the form that we can determine which use a particular utterance, uh, utterance involves. So it's not in the form itself. It's, it's how the person, uh, you, how you, whether you think, uh, what you, how you think the person is using it. Um, now, Saul Kripke, uh, in terms of uh, one of the debates over time was whether names or you know names of things like table and water and whatnot, if they do they have meaning? Do they have you know we know they have they can be used for reference, but do they have sense? And um, some people argue that they do have meaning. Some people said they don't. But Kripke kind of won the game by saying, actually, no, they don't have them. Um, they're just 
this causal chain, a historical or causal theory of names, which basically said that at some point it may have been motivated in terms of how you name it, but over time it gets passed on not because of that motivation, but just because of this historical transmission of mother to child and generation after generation. So they don't have meaning, but they're used to refer to what they're used to because that's the custom in the language community. Uh, it's just a habit on a personal level and the, 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 the custom or uh, you know, the, the normal practice within that community. So they just passed out from generation to generation and there's this historical chain of transmission. So the first person who called a kind of liquid water, uh, we don't know why they called it water, but they did, and, and it just got passed on, and, and so they're not really analyzable. Uh, Kripp, uh, Green says, Kripke said, the way the reference of a name is fixed is of little importance. What matters is that there be a chain, and that for each name speaker understand the same reference. Now, why is that problematic? I mean, this is my question, why is that problematic? The meaning of words can change. Yeah, the meaning of words can change. So there really doesn't, it really, and also not only historically do they change, uh, you know, like in the example I just gave, uh, a table or whatever, but um, the, we, we're constantly expanding it and uh, uh, like the use of board. Uh, we use, board originally meant it as a plank of wood, but we use it in so many different ways, like chairman of the board and the board of trustees and all this other stuff. It all goes back to that same plank of wood, but we use it in so many different ways. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not the same referent. And also in, a, in an individual context, it's never the same referent. We are always constantly using, you know, when I say, give me some water or, or there's a glass of water there or there's a, there's a book on the table, it's going to be a different referent each time. And we're not necessarily going to understand the referent from the word. We have to understand the referent from our, intent, our understanding of the speaker's intention in using the word. And they may use a number of different words to refer to the same referent. So yeah, it's not really fixed that way. So Kripke, though, had this idea that certain things were very rigid. Uh, and this, I think, is a very problematic uh, way of looking at things. He called them rigid designators and non-rigid designators. So he said that certain things, certain names, like proper names like George Washington, Verbal Anderson, uh, refers to the same referent in all possible worlds, whereas a non-rigid designator refers to different referents in different worlds. For example, titles and other expressions that could refer to different people given different circumstances, like Miss Australia, the president of the US, or the head of the department. Um, but what's, that, to me, is also problematic. Um, because if you say that, say something like George Washington, first of all, in the early days, people didn't have surnames, right? And I'll talk in a minute about where surnames come from. But uh, we just had names that we called each other. And certainly within a small community, then when you had when you were called George, George actually goes back to a farmer. It's from Greek, uh, uh, which means uh, worker of the earth, a farmer. Uh, so it actually had meaning of a type and, and may have been referred to somebody who was a farmer. Uh, but uh, that's not what's so important, but it, it the idea of saying that George has to refer to a particular person, or even if you want to go further and say, okay, George Washington has to refer to another person, this means that there can't be more than one person who is named George Washington. So, of course, within certain contexts, if we're talking about presidents of the United States and we say George Washington, then we know which reference is being talked about, but then we've restricted the context to a particular narrow, group of 45 people, uh, and only one of them is named George Washington. So that's not too problematic. But if you just want to say very generally that George Washington and Bertel Anderson, that there's only one person who's ever named George Washington, or even especially if you want to say one person named George, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and this is why uh, the uh, surnames developed, because 
when we just had single names, there was a lot of people with the same name, and so we needed to disambiguate them. We needed to constrain the interpretation of which referent you were talking about. And that's precisely because there's no such thing as rigid, rigid designators. So when I, I would say like Bill, and they'd say, well, which Bill? You know, because there's more than one Bill. I know more than one Bill, so it's not a rigid designator. So I say Bill over the green, and so that's how we get the surname Bill Green. Uh, or Bill the Carpenter, you know, we get the surname Bill Carpenter. Uh, or like Leonardo da Vinci, right? So his name was not da Vinci. He lived in a town called Vinci. So he was, so when people were talking about him though, he was just Leonardo. And if you look at his paintings, he just signed Leonardo. Um, and, but in order to distinguish him from other Leonardos, they added the place where he came from. Uh, like just like we say Jesus of Nazareth, right? So you say Leonardo da Vinci means Leonardo from or of uh, Vinci. Uh, and same with DiCaprio, Di Napoli, Vincent van Gogh. Uh, Smith is, is like Carpenter and Miller. These are uh, jobs that people had. Smith means somebody works with iron. Uh, Carpenter is somebody who works with wood. Miller is somebody who mills grains, right? So these are important jobs in the past. So you say, okay, you know, go, go look for Bill. And I say, which Bill? Well, Bill the Carpenter, or Bill the Smith, or Bill uh, the Miller. Uh, and so these things came about. Another way that they come, that we get surnames, is by reference to someone else. So like in the Scandinavian countries, people, uh, like in, in Iceland, even up to today, they don't have fixed surnames. They take the name of their father as their surname, but they add the word son or daughter to it. So Anderson means the son of Ender. So if you are um, Horst or something, and then your father's name is Ender, then you'd be Horst Anderson. But your son will be Horstson or something like that. Uh, not Anderson, because he's not Anderson. Uh, uh, and with some, some cultures, they do it by the grandfather. Uh, like in Cambodia, you are named with by your grandfather's name. In Japan, they often did it on the basis of location. And in, in, uh, in Western cultures also, to some extent, like I mentioned, Bill Green or something like that could be Bill over the green. Uh, but like Hashimoto, uh, Yamamoto, Kaobata, uh, Kawaguchi, uh, Jessica da Alba, uh, she now dropped the D, uh, but uh, it's the same as these others, like DiCaprio and DiNapoli, it means from that place uh, or of that place. And so these, this was another way. So these were all ways of constraining who you were talking about. So it's really very clear evidence that the names that were used before that were not rigid designators. There's no such thing as a rigid, rigid designator. You always have to infer the speaker's intention in using a thing and you can constrain the interpretation by using some extra name on there. Now this one, maybe I'll skip over this. Uh, just a quick mention for those who can read Chinese, if you say Mengzi, Mengzi Zhu, uh, Zhu, uh, in this case the Mengzi doesn't mean the philosopher Meng Xing, uh, the surname Meng, uh, and the philosopher Zhu. This actually, this is a surname. Zi is a surname, and Meng means the first child of the Zi family, uh, and he has died. Uh, so the, this is the the first child of that. In in ancient China, in during the very early period when you had lots of countries, each country only had one surname, and only the uh, the ruling class had the surname. The average people, you know, what we now think of as Lao Bai Xing, actually didn't have. Any Xing. Uh, the Lao Bai Xing or the just the Bai Xing were the, the 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 rulers of the different countries. So here the Tzu was the Song Guo. For Song Guo, the, the Tzu was the was the the surname. So the the concept of surname in Chinese has changed over time, but they've used it as a way of identifying a certain group of people. Uh, and in this case, an individual by not so much using a personal name, but by identifying the birth order. And birth order was something that was very important uh, in identifying people and their relative status in Chinese society up until very recently. Okay.
So uh, Green says, note, however, that although a name like Joe will be used to refer to different individuals on different occasions of use, that doesn't make it a non-rigid designator. Rather, since there are many individuals who have been named or dubbed Joe, on each occasion of use, Joe is a rigid designator who is successfully used to refer, depends on speaker and addressee, taking it to be the name of the same individual. Why is this problematic? It imagines an ideal relationship between a name and an individual, but the way we actually use language doesn't seem to match up to that relationship. Right, and also it's it's when you say it's a rigid designator, it means it's fixed in some way. But then she goes on to say that it's the successful use of the uh, use to refer depends on the speaker and adversary taking it to be the name of the same individual. So it's. It's not the word that has a rigid designation. It's just in that context, you have to understand <clears throat> that the speaker is using it to refer to that particular person. So I don't, otherwise I think green is, is generally pretty good. But in this case, I don't see how she calls that rigid because it's obviously not rigid if it's up to that particular context that we have to assume. Like when we're talking about like the example I gave earlier of George Washington, if we're talking about among the the presidents of the United States, then yes, we can talk about George Washington. There's, we're not going to be in confusion. But on another context, you know, like it uh, may be, you know, something very different. <coughs> so uh, that's why I think this is kind of problematic. This quote. One of her main points in the chapter is that referring expressions are really no different from indexical expressions in terms of the hearer having to guess what the speaker means to refer to by using the expression rather than being able to rely on something inherent in meaning in the word. So that's why I don't understand why she could still go along with the concept of rigid designators, because she's saying very clearly that it's about the hearer having to guess what the speaker means to refer to by the use of some word. Uh, it's not something inherent in the meaning of the word. That is, even something that seems as straightforward as the ham sandwich could refer to many different things. And so the hearer has to guess at the intention of the speaker. So she uses the example of like, oh, the, the ham sandwich wants a side of fries. So you can use anything to refer to anybody or any, any other thing, you know, any word. You can use any word, any expression. And uh, we call this metonymy metho or, you know, metaphor or many different ways. But you can, uh, talk about people uh, like she does with the, with the ham sandwich in using all kinds of weird expressions. And But as long as people can recognize who it is you're talking about or what it is you're talking about, then it works. She says, thus, just as any interpreter of a discourse has to make a calculated guess about what is intended by the use of indexical terms, he must guess at what kinds were intended by the utterance of various lexical referring expressions. It's clear enough that this sort of guessing is required to interpret anaphoric terms like he, a little less obvious with proper names like Bob, but is equally required with kind, kind names and definite and indefinite noun phrases such as the ham sandwich or an elm. So here she is really very much going in a fully pragmatic route and, and not ascribing any kind of meaning to the words themselves, but looking at how they're used and the, the inference of the hearer in, uh, in terms of understanding the intention of the speaker. Despite this, communication through language succeeds to a satisfactory extent, and it succeeds to the extent that it does because language use is a social and cultural phenomenon. It is, the best, it is in the best interest of the members of a linguistic community to act as if they were a social contract and assume more or less standard references for standard words in the language even though, strictly speaking, it is impossible for there to be standard references for standard words. When what a word is used to refer to depends on what the speaker intends it to be taken to be intended to refer to, and it's impossible to know what it what is in another person's mind and know what she uses, say, drug to refer to. So this is really a very good uh, way of saying it, and it, and it very much mirrors, if you remember the quote I gave from uh, a wharf in uh, lecture one, 
that it's a kind of agreement that we all have that the words will have kind of similar usages uh, certain you know that we'll, we'll agree to use them in certain ways but it still depends on uh, uh, when a word is used to refer it depends on what the speaker intends it to be taken to be intended to refer to and it's impossible to know what is in another person's mind and know what she uses a drug to refer to so you can never really know what the person refers to you can make a guess about what you think they intended to mean and then you go with that uh, and so it's really very much uh, a an, an open question is there's there's no fixed uh, meanings so given this understanding the idea of rigid designators is then problematic because in all cases one needs to infer what reference the speaker is referring to by the use of a particular name so there's no such thing as a word having a rigid designation or even true attributive or semantic reference because everything is speaker reference. So even though they liked in the past to distinguish between sense and reference and between uh, attributive reference or semantic reference and speaker reference, it's really all speaker reference. In other words, it's always about inferring why did the speaker use that particular word? What are they referring to? So it depends on the inference of the speaker's intention in using the form. Um, so any questions about that so far? So that's, that's reference generally. Uh, we're actually hopefully going to finish on time today. Uh, any questions about reference generally? OK. Uh, so. Uh, one aspect in English is that we have this word the, and it has the pragmatic function of aiding the addressee in inferring the speaker's intended reference, but no semantic function beyond that in fixing or delimiting truth conditions. So the word the is just a way, as I would put it, is a way of constraining the interpretation, in a, but not as much as a didactic element. So if you use it, if I say this microphone, which is not in place properly, um, if, if you say this microphone, then I'm saying that the microphone, when I use the word this, I'm saying not only is it an identifiable referent, but it's also something close to me. Whereas if I say that microphone, then I'm talking about one that's farther away from me. Now notice how the this and that is just relative to each other. They're still pretty close to me, but I can say this and that because this one is farther from, from me than that one. So that helps you identify which one I'm talking about. Whereas the, the actually comes from the word that. It's actually a, a historically uh, a form of that. Uh, the, and, um, but what happened is it, it got used so often just for identifiability rather than location that it lost that sense of location. So when I say the microphone, I am telling you, I'm constraining it in terms of your interpretation. I'm telling you that you can identify it, or I assume you can identify it, but I'm not telling you where relative to me. So that's the difference between the and this and that. So a lot of languages don't have definite marking like the. Uh, and uh, so then they will, they will often use didactic pronouns much more often than we do. But this is what it does. It's, it's constraining the interpretation. <clears throat> now, there is, in terms of uh, approaches to uh, understanding meaning, since we just talked about how reference, you can use any word to refer to basically anything. There was a guy named Jeff Lundberg in 1978 came out with the idea of infinite polysemy, that all words could be used to mean anything. And this was quite radical for 1978, because in 1978, they're still locked into this idea that all languages work the same way and all meanings were fixed and all this other kind of things, very non-empirical assumptions. But he was kind of uh, cutting edge and he um, came up with this idea that you can use a word in many different ways because there are this, there's no basic or standard sense for a word but there are many ways that we can use it. And so he called those different ways that we can use it the P senses or possible senses. P senses stands for possible senses. Um, 
And so, uh, so there's in general there's no basic or uh, standard p sent possible sense for a referring term. Um, <clears throat> and successful reference is possible because our linguistic competence includes the ability to derive additional p senses from a given p sense. So, the, the using a fairly small number of recursive combinable functions, which you call referring functions. So, what he was basically trying to do is he saw that we could use any word in any way we wanted to, and it was all up to inference. So he was trying to do, so rather than, he didn't call it abductive inference, but it's basically abductive inference. Why did the person use this word? How are they intending it? Um, so he tried to come up with a kind of way of formalizing it uh, by, by coming up with these so-called referring functions. Uh, and these relate one p sense to another, such as contents of, container of, publisher of, product of, cause of, types of, location of, possessor of. So something like New York Times, if I, I can use it to refer to the actual paper New York Times, I can use it to refer to the publisher New York Times, I can use it to refer to the uh, reporters for New York Times, I can use it to refer for many other things. But I can relate all of those uses by supposedly by these referring functions, like publisher of, product of, cause of. Um, <clears throat> the fact is that limit the number of normal interpretations an expression can have, or the normal beliefs of the community, and the relevance in the context. So this goes back to what I was talking about: the normal kind of our assumed, assumed normality. So the normal beliefs that we have about the way things work in the world. Uh, this is part of our whole agreement as a community, is that we have shared beliefs about the way the world works. Um, <clears throat> so this, uh, these normal beliefs of the community and the relevance in the context means, OK, within a particular context, when I refer to George Washington, for example, you know, if we're talking about presidents, then a particular George Washington makes perfect sense. But in another context, in a family, the Washington family, and there's a guy named George within that family, then I'm talking about George Washington, then the president is not relevant there. So uh, so basically this means that the use of the word in that utterance has to be interpretable in that context, given the usual normal beliefs of the community and the particular predication being made about the validity of referent. Now the reason why this normal beliefs is important is because that's how we make our abductive inferences, right? Because as I mentioned in week one, we create a context of interpretation, and that context of interpretation is based on our normal beliefs. We will take what we know, and we will create a context in which what the person says makes sense. So this is why the normal beliefs of the community and the particular predication being made about the rep, in other words, the, the immediate context, that's also part of the context of interpretation. Uh, so, and then he, he discusses what he sees as different stages of conventionalization. So different, different things may get conventionalized. So the different uses of the word can become more or less conventionalized. So that's another factor that influences the interpretation. So if I use a word like, like with unicorn, I gave you the example unicorn. We could, I should really go back and go through all those again, or maybe do those after the lecture. Um, but uh, like the unicorn, uh, so the, uh, what he means by this, this um, conventionalization is that something like unicorn, like I mentioned 20 years ago, it would have definitely meant this horse with a thing sticking out of its head, a uh, horn, uh, a single horn, that's why it's called unicorn. Uh, and I don't know, that may be a folk etymology, but anyway. Uh, so, but then over time, we can conventionalize different uses that become more common, right? So we don't talk about unicorns that much, or maybe to little kids, I don't know, but adults don't talk about unicorns that often. Now, and now the, this new type of entrepreneur type unicorn is more common reference. So that's going to kind of be more salient in our minds when we, when we hear that. So Green says a normal use is then one which speakers judge to be consistent with the system of normal beliefs. So again, you're making sense of it with, based on your own beliefs. Consequently, what it is considered normal to use tack or host or rock or metal to refer to 
varies with the community. So this is the examples I gave earlier. So would you use school to mean uh, any educational institution or you just use it to mean K to 12 as the Brits do? Uh, so these are societal facts, social facts, facts about societies, and only incidentally and contingently and secondarily facts about words. You get that? So these aren't really facts about words. They are facts about our society and how we decide to use these things, right? Our concepts, and also it, it goes back to our, our cognitive categories, but also how we label those categories. So more precisely, there are facts about what speakers believe, other speakers believe, about conventions for using words. So it's reciprocal in the sense that we are talking in a way that we want the other person to understand. So we're actually um, playing on what we think is they are believing, right? So this is what she means by uh, facts about what speakers believe, other speakers believe. So we use words in a way that we think the other person will understand it because we're assuming certain beliefs on the part of that person. So this is really complex interaction, a reciprocal type of thing going back and forth in communication. So language itself is actually very simple, but communication is complex because of all of the inference and the accommodation between people, the interaction between people is, gets, becomes complex. It's really not in the words or the structures themselves, the complexity. Uh, these are just some other examples. We got 10 minutes. Uh, Maybe I'll go through them. This is, I don't know, I haven't seen this kind of humor for a long time. There used to be a comic named Noam Crosby who would um, get up on stage and it was like a stand-up comic, but what he would do is tell a story and use the wrong words in many cases. And I'll give you an example. So uh, here is this person, Bob, writes to Bill, Mr. Crosby and says, Absent knowing how to reach you, I am trying this route. I understand you have a date in Boyton at the temple in, in December. Marcia and I would love to see you, break bread, have a drink, and have you stay over with us. And then uh, invites him over. And Norm Crosby writes back in his typical style. He said, great to hear from you. Apparently, there has been some sort of excommunication here on the internet. And I'm glad you brought this to my detention. Uh, you seem to have gotten my email address off some website called Shtick, where they have a column that claims to be written by yours truly. Uh, actually, I've read the fake S. Norm Cosby column, and I wish I had found this Charlie Rist Ristick guy back when I was looking for writers for Norm Cosby's comedy shop. We had so many so-called comedy writers for that show come in and out of there, we should have installed a revolting door. So. He goes on and on. So can you get what's going on here? Like he's using the wrong words. These are called malapropisms, based on so a, uh, a novel by George Bernard Shaw, where there's a woman named Malaprop who does this all the time. She, well, she's trying to sound educated, so she's using these words, but using them in, in, in a way that's not the, the, the normal way within that society. So here, uh, you know, he's using like, instead of saying miscommunication, he says excommunication. Uh, instead of internet, he called into nests. And instead of brought to my attention, he said to my detention. Um, now, this was actually a kind of comedy, and people used to laugh a lot at this, but somehow now I never see people doing this anymore. And you guys didn't seem to laugh at all at this, but it's all right. Uh, so, and, you know, we can rename things all the time. Like this printer is now called Bob Marley because it's always jamming. You know, so you have to know what jamming means, and you have to know that there are two different uses of the word there. Or like this one, when I said nuke the Chinese, I meant put the takeout in the microwave, right? So here you have to know that nuke the Chinese is, is a common American expression for you get Chinese takeout food and then you heat it in the microwave, right? So we, we talk about microwaving something as nuking it. So I'm gonna nuke this, you know, because it's, uh, so nuke the Chinese means, you know, take, take out, put the takeout in the microwave. Uh, so the bottom line to all of this is an even more radical pragmatics. Uh, there are no referring functions. All that's required is that the addressee be able to make sense of the use of a particular form to refer to a particular referent. This is based on inference, which of course depends on real world knowledge and common sense, what a 
when he talked about his normal beliefs, but in our society, we would think of it as common sense. In other words, common, everyone has the same beliefs, so uh, the normal, so-called normal beliefs means the beliefs that everyone has, commonly has, so it's called common sense. Okay, uh, any questions uh, up to now? If not, we've got just five minutes. I just want to show you something, another little bit of silliness. It's about referring expressions. 18,000 authentic brands to discover on 99 last month, big brand sale. About the language that they speak, they say they speak English, but they have to change it to make them understand it more. Go with me on this, because I thought it through. <laughs> they changed some of the words, so they've taken the English language, but they've looked at some of it and they thought, no, no, I think we need a little bit more explanation here. Okay, that's my reference. So things like pavement, so they can't work, work with pavement, so they've changed it to sidewalk. They needed more information. They needed to know where. They were going to be walking, <laughs> so that they wouldn't get run over. So that's it. I didn't think of that. Hey, but sidewalks. And I think there must have been a period of time where they ran with the pavement, but they kept getting hit by cars. <laughs> so they changed the sidewalk. Now bear with me, John, because I thought this through. Bin, the word for bin. In American, waste paper basket. They needed to know what, not only what to put in it, they needed to know that not only it was paper, but waste paper, and then it goes into a basket. It's not just anything, they kept throwing away fresh paper for a period of time. They introduced the word waste paper basket. You see, it's like they need instructions. Glasses, if you're artists, they call them eyeglasses. They need to know where to put them on their heads. Because they used to have glasses and they would put them on their thighs, and on their feet, and they would say, I can't see any better with my glasses. And they said, they didn't know their eyeglasses. Well, why didn't you call them my glasses? There's a game called Squash. Have you heard of it? Yes. Not in America. Rapid ball. They need to know what they were going to be playing with and rapid ball. And even then they get confused because there's no court. They don't know where to go. They just wander through the street and I want to play rapid ball. I want to play rapid ball. So I don't really have to change that. But my favorite one without the shadow down is horse riding. Do you know what horse riding is in America? It is not called horse riding. No. Horseback riding. <laughs> They didn't call it for well, they go. They had limbs to hold on to the tail. <laughs> 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 So, I mean, this is, in, in some ways, it makes sense. I mean, uh, we don't actually use the word waste paper basket too often, but, and then there are other people in the comments uh, under this video, uh, people also mentioned tuna fish. Uh, he said it would be like saying beef mammal. Uh, you know, we don't say beef mammal, so why do we say tuna fish? Uh, and then, of course, they think that was calling autumn fall because the leaves fall, the leaves fall down. Uh, they think it's very weird. Um, let me see. Yeah, and then of course rubber is a real problem. Yeah, because for in Brits rubber means an eraser, but in America it means a condom. So if you ask somebody for a condom for a rubber, uh, it, you gotta want to make sure you know who you're talking to. Okay. Um, so uh, that's just showing how you know uh, over time you can either have more. Uh, uh, explicit expressions or less explicit sections, de depending on whether you feel you need to constrain the interpretation in a particular way or not. Now, so he's saying that Americans are too dumb, so they need to constrain the interpretation uh, much more. But uh, it's you know it's just a joke. Okay, sorry. Actually, I just realized we were supposed to stop at ten to not at six. But anyway, uh, any comments, questions before we? Wake up for today. Okay, that's it for today then. Thanks.